for there. Okay. Okay, let's see if, see if I work. Excellent, I can hear myself. So um, one thing I like about ARM is we have really nice toys. Uh, so thanks for the demo. Uh, my background's in processor verification. Let's go figure a processor person. So whenever I see new stuff, I always think about all the ways it's gonna break. So uh, it's always interesting to see live demos. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm Eric Hennenhafer and I run ARM Research. Uh, my background is processor design and verification. I also went and uh, started a company to build verification tools. So I ran a software dev team for many years and got acquired by ARM. And for the last five years, I've been at ARM doing things in engineering. And about a year ago, I moved over to run research. So ARM research, <clears throat> we have a time scale with our projects in about three to five years. So if you think about the product team is building the next product N, we're out at N plus two uh, kind of uh, time frame. And then by the time our, pro our technology gets into products, a lot of times it's gonna be five to 10 years until it hits market. We do a mixture of advanced development, which is, hey, some things for current products, and blue sky stuff, which is disruptive technologies, which really could be anything. Uh, we're spread across four locations. Uh, Austin, Texas, where I am, is also Cambridge, UK, out in Silicon Valley, and Shanghai. And we have three main objectives. The, the, the first one, which most of us work on, is developing a pipeline of new technology to get into ARM products. And from, from researchers' view, if our technology doesn't make it into a product or influence it, it doesn't really count. Um, the other things we do is we do technology road mapping, trying to figure out what all these new technologies are doing. And we also are the primary interface to academia. So work with universities on research partnerships and also just helping them get things when they need technology from ARM. So I'm gonna walk through some of the areas of our research. All of these things I could talk about for a week. Uh, my researchers could talk even longer about them. Um, but I'm gonna be here through end of Tuesday, so happy to chat some more. We have a memory group. So the memory group, other than watching standards and being involved, we're doing a lot of work with non-volatile. Um, a lot of interesting things are happening in non-volatile memory, building very large systems. Hey, what do we need to have in the architecture to support that? Um, and so that, that's pretty neat, and you know, there's this general trend to get compute near memory and, and how that would work. We do architecture work. About half of the new architecture starts in research. So last year, the V8M trust zone stuff was a research technology that eventually came out. Um, so that's our super secret stuff. Um, so we're doing that, and we're, we're looking at pretty much everything you'd expect. Security, new applications, how to make the ARM architecture work better. We do applied silicon. I'm gonna talk about some examples from here. A lot of this is IoT, sensor node. You know, what can we do with the, with the silicon we have today uh, and turn it into real things? And energy harvesters, and I have some slides on that. We also look at future silicon technology. For, for the recent history, we've been going down this curve and, and things in the future look kinda of like what they did in the past. Going further, it's gonna change a lot more. There's gonna be different ratios between the, what memory costs, how fast wires are compared to logic, and unless we understand that and we can model technology which doesn't exist yet, we don't know how to build our processors uh, so they'll work well in that since we need to start well before the technologies are developed. So we have a lot of work going on there about what's coming up in, in silicon technology. We have the Large Scale Systems Group, which does HPC computing, and I have some slides on this one here. Um, a lot of this is about data movement and scale. How do you scale up compute? And the last group is, uh, actually, a couple more, is, is design integrity, and this has to do with how we can invest in technology to build processors better. So this group mostly works on formal methods. A lot of the verification of processors is very, very similar to software verification. You run simulations, you find bugs, you debug things. Uh, the formal side is using the power of math basically to prove assertions. So it's maybe a super static checker. And the formal methods that get used in CPU design to prove a floating point unit will work are also are basically permeating out to other areas. So if you look inside the cryptocurrencies, you know, how do you know your proof of stake's really gonna work? Well, you can formally prove that it will happen. Or if you have some sort of complicated protocol, you know, how do you know it's not gonna deadlock? Well, you can prove that. 
Um, if you have a bunch of PhDs, you know a lot of math. Uh, we have an emerging applications group. So what this group does is it looks at emerging applications um, and says, hey, is there anything different about this? Um, or is it going to change how computers are built or how the architecture might need to be done? And, and so machine learning is one of the big ones right now, computer vision, um, advanced graphics. And then even research has the other bin, uh, our special projects. So even we have some extra special people in research. Uh, we have a motor project. You know, what if we threw more, more compute at motors? Could we make them more efficient? Electric motors chew up about 23% of the energy on the planet. It'd be great if they work better. We do road mapping. We also do a lot of, you know, we get phone calls from random places at ARM. Hey, we help us go look at this technology. And our researchers uh, do those projects. Okay, so on to IoT. So what's going on here? So the fundamental issue is we have a bunch of little devices out on the edge, which we call things, and we need to get that data up to the web. And, and what this assumes is that we're going to be able to build all kinds of sensors that are going to be able to create interesting data. And if you look at some of the projections, they start talking about a trillion units uh, 10 years from now. That's a lot of sensors. Um, so, so I thought it'd be fun to go look at it and say, well, you know, are these sensors actually going to work? The assumption is that we can build all kinds of interesting sensors. What's going on? So I wanted to walk through the main senses. So the first sense is touch. It turns out touch is easy. This is, this is actually out of a physics textbook. Remember the springs, the weights on springs? Well, that's how you, you build an accelerometer. And inside these chips, there's a mass there, there's a spring, there's a capacitor. So as the mass moves, as you accelerate or decelerate it, you get a different reading, electrical, and you can figure out uh, if you're accelerating or not, which gets you to touch. These are relatively big circuits, which means they're cheap, and you can build them in uh, fabs that are fully depreciated. And things like safety and airbags have driven the cost way down. Not only that, we can take these and hook them up to other kinds of things so we can build small sense touchers. Um, so th this one looks, looks pretty easy. The other thing I'll, I'll point out is how small semiconductor chips are. So you know, this is technology on nanometers. So we're down here today at 22 nanometer at the end. Um, so chips have been small for a long time, but the scale of these means we're well into the biological size. So blood vessels are actually pretty large. Um, so again, one thing we can do is we can use older fabs that are depreciated, and we can build little tiny labs. And the, the size of the etchings we can do are, work quite well uh, with uh, biology. And we can do things to build uh, both taste and smell sensors. So what you have up there is if you take a wire and you stick some molecules to it, so one end sticks to the wire, and the other end you can put some sort of recept uh, basically receptacle on it. These are the, this is essentially how cells work in your body. And that'll latch on to a certain pattern of a molecule. So you can make one of those that'll latch on to a piece of DNA or any kind of complicated molecule, and there's a whole industry building those. You basically stick those on there, and then when that molecule comes floating along, It'll latch on to it, and it'll change the electrical properties of the wire. So from that, we can figure out about how many of these are connecting. This device over here, which doesn't look too good, looks a little bit dark, is a, uh, it measures peanut concentration in parts per million, um, doing something like that. So you, know, you can do this to measure food quality, air quality, diseases, you know, terrorism alerts, all kinds of stuff. So this, again, works well with today's semiconductor technology, and it continues to scale. And if we get to the last senses of, of hearing and sight, you now first off, we'll just send out a big thanks to the phone industry, because the phone in industry has driven image sensors, you know, hugely uh, in complexity and, and down in cost. Over here, there's this graph which shows some progression of circuits. That, and what you're seeing from a computer person, a semiconductor person, is, is a, a pretty s complicated circuit. They're taking one circuit, they're sticking another one on top, and they're putting memory on it. But this is all effectively dirt cheap because it's a mass volume. And we can take these things and reuse them in IoT without having to pay for all the development costs. 
The other one is a, a nanoparticle, and so you can basically build these systems that can detect sound waves very, very precisely at certain wavelengths. And this one here is a crack sensor, so it's got super ears, and it can listen to cracks. Um, and because it's just a single nanoparticle, it's tiny. And so what we're seeing across all of these different senses is that we can build things that are as good or better and will continue to become cheaper and cheaper as all of our senses. So that's all a good story from IoT. So, so the, the challenge that we're going to have is energy. So there won't be a problem with building the stuff, but it'll be how do we keep them on. And this is a, kind of a busy slide. One thing that comes up is, well, you know, energy harvesters, solar cells are only getting better at, hey, 1% a year. So I get questions about, well, wait a second, I thought chips were like a million times better. Why aren't these getting any better? The story here is that our computer chips um, use very little of the computational power of, the, of what they're built out of. So we went through uh, transistors and vacuum tubes, and they got to the end, and we jumped to a new technology. When you look at what we're building now, we can talk about getting to the end. We're not getting to the end of what you can build out of matter. We're getting to the end of what you can build out of CMOS. And hey, the question is, what's next? Nanotubes, all we, all we go. The problem with energy is that we don't have an endless amount. So when you talk about a solar cell that's 10% to 40%, you can't get it to 110% efficiency. There's no way to give 110%. So these can't actually get much better. Um, yeah, maybe we can get 2x out of them, maybe we can get them cheaper, but we're not going to get 10x out of what we can do today. So that's one of the things you just kind of have to accept. This, this, this one's not going to move very much. The graph here shows different sources of energy, so vibrations, thermal, thermal sunlight, so these are, you know, solar calculators, been running forever, uh, biochemistry. And one of the trends you get is, well, you could probably extract about 100 uh, microwatts or milliwatt microwatts out of, out of these various sources. So the question then is not how do we get this up, but the question is how do we get down uh, what we need to run on it. And so here are some examples of those, um, you know, 100 watts, a little solar chip here. So I have a couple pictures here. Oh, before we get there, the question is, well, well what can you really get out of power? And you know, this is 100 picojoules, and, and it's not really about the picojoules, but it's, it's the ratio. So on 100 picojoules, you can run an M0 for 10 cycles. Um, you could write one bit of flash. You could write quite a few bits to an on-chip memory, but if you start going off-chip, not very much. If you start going wireless, well, you're, you're not getting many bits at all, and if you try to drive your Tesla, it's not going to happen. So, um, you know, you'll see there's, there's a very um, well-defined characteristics of, of the cost between commute and moving the data around. And so this is going to be the optimization problem when we start talking about these in more detail. So this is one from one of our partner in Michigan. This is a, a, a relatively large technology, 180 nanometer, runs at 30 picojoules. It's tiny. You know, that's a coin it's on. Um, so we can build this stuff. We can build this stuff with old technology today. It's got the solar cell right on top of it, so it's got all the pieces. Um, this is one built on a more advanced technology, and it runs at 11 picojoules per cycle, which doesn't really tell us anything. What we really want to know is, well, what does it run some application on? Because I need to know how many cycles. So this is a workload for a heart monitor. You'll see the little pluses are, are little peaks of when it's on. So the chip's mostly off. But we can go and run heart monitoring software about three microwatts, two microwatts with today's chips. And if we can pull out about 100, it says, hey, look, this is, this is very doable. It may be hard once we find there's a problem actually telling someone, that's going to be where the real energy goes. But these are the kind of things that, that look very good, and we'll continue to work on getting the processor power down. Okay, so that's a little tiny, so let, let's talk about some of the bigger areas. 
Uh, so this is CERN, big supercomputer. It's actually, it's, a, it's part of a virtual giant supercomputer with all kinds of tiering. And in the basement, uh, the physicists have a really big basement. They keep their atom smashers. And out of that, the latest runs talk about 25 gigabytes per second. This is the square uh, kilometer telescope array. It's that squaring that's the, the issue. Um, so a lot of telescopes, and the data pouring out of this is on the order of 200 terabytes per second. It's not built yet, but, but this is, these are the numbers we're talking about. This is continuous, always on, faucet, boom. Over on the, uh, so those are Europe. Over on the US side, we have the same problem. DARPA is trying to figure out how to be able to stream more data. And, and this is a drones. These are flying supercomputers, energy constrained. Uh, you know, we have rovers. And we have the national labs looking at this. And, and so everyone's really excited about streaming data because the scientists in the past have worked on like fluid flow or basically with some, some piece of data they just keep crunching. And they figured out the major class of algorithms and kind of put them in the libraries and, and we know how to do most of those. This, this is new. You know, how do, how do we do this? And so everyone's trying to come up with the next generation of big data and streaming algorithms. Um, and if we step back and say, well, how, how big is this? And the answer is it's really, really big. Um, you know, NASDAQ transactions, a terabyte a day. You know, YouTube uploads, 200 terabytes. Walmart, if the data's coming off GE's turbines alone, 120 petabytes. CERN's 88 exabytes, massive data, okay? So one, we're not gonna be able to get this to the cloud, um, but you know, we, you think we have a lot of data today, well, guess what's coming? Okay, so I was gonna say a few words about security. Um, and I was, I have a case study from a couple of years ago on hacking teddy bears, which were baby monitors. And it was depressing because I went looking for the reference and there were three pages of hacked teddy bears just this year alone. So it seems like it keeps happening again and again and again. Um, so a few things about security. First, hackers love IoT. This is great. You know, no longer do you need to connect to, say, a bank, which might not want you to. You can just go buy one of these things. And if your software fails, don't work. So you sacrifice a few teddy bears for science and take them apart. Find the UART, and in you go. This is 90% this is of it. And well, sometimes you need to go and find the headers, because they've hidden it a little bit. But in you go, and you can go play with it and take it apart. So just a couple basics. You know, These devices, you need to plan for them to be hacked. Just, they're going to be hacked. They need to be hardened. You need things like secure boot, some sort of secure kernel. You know, Perimeter defenses are not enough. If you keep putting more locks in the front door, well, they're going to come in the back because someone's going to leave the back open. Um, this is, uh, there's a Tesla case they did at DEF CON this year, and it was that once they managed to get in, it was free reign. So you can't just have egg cell security. You need to do some sort of intrusion detect detection because it's like, you know, if you let the mice in the granary, they're going to let them stay there long enough, it's going to cause a problem. So if they get into the kitchen, then they're going to bring their tools on in, and they're going to drill through the wall. Just, you know, give it enough time, this is what's going to happen. So you need to do something like you, the secure side of your machine, check some hashes and wipe the thing when it notices there's a problem. You need some way to slow them down. Um, but the only really way to, to deal with this is you need to have secure over there updates. Because even if you're wiping them out every seven minutes, you know, in IoT, you're energy constrained. So you, you're not going to be able to look for them all the time. And even if you brick the device, they can just buy another one and they got seven minutes in. And so, and so anything that doesn't have secure over the air, it, it will lose. So one of you guys' slides, so, so these are the main pieces, you know, but we just need, this stuff needs to be everywhere um, by default. So we can stop with this teddy bear problem. Um, okay, so, um, you know, we're gonna have this end-to-end -end network, things like the space telescope, it's a hierarchy, so you're gonna have to compute all through the nodes. Your endpoint devices need to be hardened, and also the network does. So the, so the other thing with the Tesla hack is, well, the, th the hardest thing about the Tesla hack was, was getting a Tesla from someone that didn't mind you taking it apart. 
Um, but when they took it apart, and it's always the Humpty Dumpty, can you get it back together again? Uh, in the console, they found some SD, SD sticks, and on there, they found the VPN keys. <laughs> so their secure firmware updates, uh, not so much. And getting that led them somewhere else. I think there were a total of six ones. The good thing about Tesla is, well, once they told them about it, they, they could push on over the air uh, and do it. And so it would be really hard to compromise otherwise. But, you know, it, it's not just Tesla. You know, everyone knows the Borg fell because of a similar problem, right? So, you know, they went and they steal the Luxutis, who, who's an endpoint node on this giant supercomputing called the Borg, and the Borg Cube, which is their flying data center. And, and they, they couldn't actually hack into him, but they're able to go through him and take down the data center. Okay, so it's not just enough to do the endpoint. The whole thing, Tesla, Borg, you know, it happens. Okay, hopping over to supercomputing. Why are we interested in supercomputing? Well, I'm in research. Of course I'm interested in supercomputing. Um, but as you can see, it just flows right down. So for ARM in general, a lot of the work we're doing in supercomputing will flow into servers and into mobile. And in addition to that, the lines are blurring. The top end of servers and the low end of supercomputing, there you go. Okay. So why do we care? So, so first, ARM. So the supercomputing HPC market wants multi-vendor. For some buyers, this is strategic. They need to have choices, and more than one ISA even. So there are people that very much want ARM to succeed in here. Um, also, the supercomputing guys want more choices because right now they really have limited ones, and the needs of the te space telescopes are different from other ones. So they would like to have a range of options with different trade-offs that they can buy from. They don't have that now. The other thing going on is we're at, we're at a compelling event. So exascale used to mean something about the size of the power. Now it just means really big. Exascale is a massive scale out. So it has, you have to have much more parallel applications. It's multi-threaded. It's going to be a nightmare to debug. Um, but they're rewriting their applications for this. So while they're rewriting their applications, now is the time. They only want to rewrite them once. So coming up with a different ISA and saying, hey, here's the pieces, port it to both at the same time, there's an opening there. Um, and we're working in really all the regions. There's active HPC stuff going on, and, and research is involved in it. So it, it is happening. So why am I telling you guys? Well, one thing, HPC has a very large open source component. Ideally, these are scientists mostly, they would want to open source everything so we can actually get to the apps. Um, and also, some of the installations require multiple tool chains. So if you're going to come and sell a proprietary one, they also want an open source tool chain. And this is really pragmatism because they're like, well, it's all going to break, right? So we need at least a second way to do it. Um, so again, the door is being opened on multiple fronts. Inside HPC, there's a, a corner called high performance data analysis, people call it different things, machine learning, stochastic modeling. What we found out is if you throw a lot more compute at some things, it's easier. So machine learning is, that's the case there. Just give me enough data and let it crank away and I'll figure out how that works. Monte Carlo method is another good example. So if you don't know how to calculate pi, get a dartboard draw a circle, throw a bunch of darts, and count how many fell in versus outside, and you can calculate pi. If you, and one of the early Monte Carlo ones was around solitaire. How do you calculate the odds of a deck, random deck, being a valid solitaire hand? Well, this is really hard to do mathematically, but it's real easy to write a solitaire simulator, shuffle 100 decks, run 100 simulations, see how many work. Problem solved. So if you can throw more compute at stuff, often a lot more compute, a lot of problems become easier. Very exciting, all kinds of stuff's falling. Um, Go just fell earlier this year, so I'm not sure what we need people left for. Um, <clears throat> so, so that's changing it. And, you know, deep learning. So this is uh, Andrew, he's one of the, he started at Stanford making helicopters fly, went over to the Google Brain Project, helped find their cats on the internet. Um, <clears throat> And from there, we went to GPUs. And so now what he's saying is, it's time to scale these things up. Okay, now, they're already big. 
So he's thinking about making them much, much, much bigger. And in his view, we're going to be able to do all kinds of new things with them. And this is not the person you bet against. Okay? So you know, we're going to rapidly see more deep learning success stories in different areas. And, and the thing that's really exciting about deep learning is it's essentially a common algorithm that works across a large array of problems. So no matter how excited you are about it now, it's actually more exciting. OK, so coming back to real problems of the day, so the question is, well, how does deep learning run on ARM? You know, let's suppose you got a grad student and said, go run it. What would happen? Um, well, the good news is that the, the deep learning algorithms are really all about matrix math operations. Right now, it's a single precision matrix multiply. This is a solved problem from the scientific community. They have math libraries that do this kind of stuff. So in some ways, a little bit disappointing, but, but there you go. 80% of the problem is, is a textbook. Um, single precision, probably half precision, longer term. Um, so if you go and you grab a math library and you run it, the first thing you find out, which you don't find out, I if you know what you're doing, you might not like the performance. And once you figure out the performance isn't good and you go look, you'll find out that it was built for single core out of the repo. So you switch to a different one, and it goes up. But what you really want is the last one, which is the, the Atlas libraries, you, you take them and you install them, you run them for a couple hours, it runs a bunch of experiments, and it, and it tunes the library for the hardware you're working on. So, and, and the first time you do it will be wrong because you'll, for, you'll forget you need to turn off all your power. And any kind of power savings will mess this up. So you've got, you got to run everything always on. But if you do all this, it's 6.7 times faster than just grabbing the one out of, out of the repo. So, and as someone that worries about you know, a CPU design 2% is interesting. 670, oh my gosh, you know, that's, that's massively huge. Um, but you likely will have, unless you know what you're doing, you could easily have lost it any one of these steps. So in the HPC community, they expect easy to access pre-compiled optimized packages, which is kind of the game plan. And you could say, hey, you know, grad students, machine learning, if you're one of those computers that are gonna take over the world, maybe we shouldn't let them do machine learning research if they can't recompile the kernel, but uh, that's not really gonna work. I mean, these are scientific users. They look at this like a microscope. Hey, I buy, set it up once, and then it's just gotta work. I don't need to have to worry about if my numbers are the best. So we need a wide range of scientific packages. The good news is most are open source, and it's actually not huge range. Um, I'm not sure what we're gonna do about power, you know, for, for most supercomputers, it's not as big of an issue in that it doesn't need to change a huge amount. But as we go into more embedded spaces, I think it's going to be interesting what we can do there. Um, and the big one is it needs tuned for each vendor and the distro. And let's add to it a collection of accelerators, which are probably in there too, that need to be easy to set up. Um, so this, you know, this choice that the ARM community offers that everyone wants, this is when it starts to get kind of hard. Um, and so the question is, well, who's going to lead on this? You know, at Supercomputing 15, which is in the fall, OpenHPC came out, which is Intel, talking about here's, and it's open in the fact that they let other people come to the meetings. Now, now maybe, um, maybe we get involved with this one. I don't, I don't know. Um, but, you know, who, who, what's the right level? Who's going to work on this problem is the question. And it's one of the things that we need to sort out, how we make this easy. Okay, so run into the summary here. So the HP systems, one, they're, they're coming, and some are here. There's test beds all over the world. We have these tool change problems, but they're running. Open source is a huge component. And today, it's, it's not traditional HPC that's the, the real driver. It's these data analytics ones, which is the, the critical piece of, of future workloads. And so from that, I'll wrap up. As we span from sensors to supercomputing, the big data starts with little data. So thank you.